Okay, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this new online seminar of the Central Asia program at GW. I'm delighted to have you uh, here with us uh, uh, today to continue our discussion on what happened in Kazakhstan and trying to take a little bit of distance, looking at uh, uh, the way we want to understand what has been happening, but also how we see things uh, moving forward. And for that, we have hopefully five, so far four uh, great speakers who have been able uh, uh, to join us. We are waiting for uh, the Simsat Payev to be able to join us from, from Almaty. Hopefully we'll uh, uh, be able to uh, get connected relatively soon. And then otherwise we have uh, with us uh, Diana Khudai-Birgenova, lecturer at the Department of Sociology at the University of Cambridge. Azama Genisbay, professor of sociology at Pitzer College in Claremont, California. Denisa Duvanova, Associate Professor of International Relations at Leijin University, and Bruce Pagne, Journalist Discovering Central Asia at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. So a great team uh, uh, put together that we really uh, welcome here, and we thank everybody for being with us also in the room. I will give the floor to each of you for about 10 minutes. Hopefully, those team will join uh, at the end, and then we will be I will be moderating the, the Q&A, so if you have any question, comments, please send them in the, in the chat box, and we should have at least half an hour at the end for, for the discussion. Uh, Diana, would you like to begin sharing your thought? I'm muted. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining and for the ongoing interest in Kazakhstan. Thank you to Marlene and the Central Asia uh, program for, for organizing. OK, uh, I think since I'm going first, I'll probably give the, 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 the whole picture, or I'll try to give at least the picture of what happened in terms of protests. Um, I just want to remind people that um, I'm a political sociologist, and today I'm going to speak um, first of all on my own behalf, but also on the behalf of uh, the type of research I've done in the past on contentious politics, uh, my latest work is going to be uh, dedicated to that, hopefully forthcoming soon, um, about the types of social movements that emerged uh, after 2019 in Kazakhstan. So, um, and um, I think, like, you know, with, with every protest like that that is happening in Kazakhstan, I think um, I'll, I'll speak with, with sort of three broad brushes um, that I see as a researcher um, that I think are useful and hopefully for other researchers to engage in that uh, debate. And the first brush that I would like to start with is that uh, what, what is happening in Kazakhstan and the way it's sort of like evolved um, since January 2022, but also everything that was there before. And I would put it in a historical perspective. Some people would like to go to the 90s, uh, especially some of my students, uh, and looking into sort of like, you know, more of a gradual process of transition from, from Soviet to post Soviet and so on. For me, the, the type of contentious politics that emerged that we're seeing on the ground right now is going back to 2011, and particularly due to the symbolic understanding how it was always in, in solidarity with Jean and that's what we're hearing from the ground is that a lot of people went to the streets precisely in January uh, in, in solidarity with Jean Um and, and this is sort of like the first caveat that I want to put forward is that in order to understand these events, we should understand them in their own perspective. This is not a colored revolution. This is not the type of template that we've seen before. In other cases, obviously it is possibly comparable to something we've seen maybe in Ukraine, um, more recently in Belarus, in, in neighboring Kyrgyzstan, maybe to an extent in Russia and so on and so forth. But definitely we should not try to sort of fixate it on the fact that it's something that fits into a particular template, especially when I'm, when I'm talking about, you know, sociologically, I think it was also to an extent in, in political analysis as well. I think we really need to look at it in its own um, capacity and in order to understand it before jumping into conclusion with specific models. That brings me to the second caveat. Obviously, everything currently at the moment as we're seeing, and we've been uh, monitoring the situation on the ground for, for, for a period of time now, um, it is evolving um, as we see it. Uh, we still need some time to sort of realize what is happening, what type of effect it has on the people on the ground. I do have con connection to, to some of my respondents and friends um, who are there. And I also understand and sort of for myself identify methodologically that there are these spaces and times of um, tra tra traumatic events and post-traumatic events that require a, a little bit of um, you know, realization and, and consideration as well for those on the ground. So I think it's very, very important not to, again, um, to address this, this uncertainty and this complexity in the sense that we're also mindful to the people who are experiencing it on the ground because there are a variety of different perspectives, sometimes often contradictory to each other or conflicting, and they emerge precisely from the post-conflict situation. And finally, the final point that, that I just want to like, you know, draw as, as a framework, um, being attentive to time especially, that uh, these events are highly complex um, and we need to address them precisely in complexity. And this is what I would try to address in my 
in my talk as well, is that uh, they emerge in, in, in Western Kazakhstan, they emerge and the trigger is about the, the rise in, in prices for LPG gas, but obviously the, the claims and the demands and the types of um, grievances that led to this particular and very mass uh, collective mobilization are much deeper and a lot more diverse and complex than, than just simply um, sort of uh, gas prices or any prices for any other consumer goods. Uh, it's very important to, to sort of contextualize it, obviously, within the socioeconomic context. Uh, we're seeing very much sort of, um, you know, the fact that this, the way that state is framing it, that we only have 5.8% of poverty line in Kazakhstan is obviously something that um, is very much far away from, from the full realization of the socioeconomic crisis that Kazakhstan found itself, especially after the first wave and the first very difficult year uh, of the pandemic. So um, that context is very important. Another context that is hugely important for Kazakhstan is that it's uh, the regional separation and the types of regions where uh, protests were emerging and the types of, uh, so regionality would also influence the type of the structure of the protest and the uh, means to which the protesters were using and how they were organizing themselves. So we see very much peaceful and very organized, although through informal networks, protests in Western Kazakhstan due to the existing um, sort of uh, experience of, of uh, all sorts of grievances, but also existing structures that were in place despite of the fact that uh, formal labor unions sort of uh, are, are diminished or not allowed in, in Western Kazakhstan, but nevertheless, there are these informal uh, networks, as I call them, not in a negative sense of informal, but actually that they exist within the social structure of the society. And then what we see in Kazakhstan, uh, in Almaty is a lot more complex situation, where on the 3rd of January, on Tuesday, um, there were existing sort of political groups, uh, and I think key, two, two of them were key to, to the emergence of, of the peaceful protest these were the groups by, led by Jean Balat Momai, who asked for, for his supporters to go on the streets and meet at the Almaty Arena uh, to, to protest, and, and another group of young Kazakhstan uh, activists and social movement to meet next to the park of the first president. Um, and why were they meeting at very two distinct and very far away places, uh, far away in terms of the very typical symbolic centers of the city, the old and the new square, precisely because they were aware of the fact that the police immediately uh, took over these two um, sort of squares, these two very symbolic spaces because they were expecting this type of uh, protest to emerge. So, and then these two groups were gradually walking towards the, 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 uh, the square, particularly the new square where December 1986 events also happened. Um, and one of the groups were already harassed by the police and beaten up. Um, and that, those things we sort of could see from the reports on, on social media. This was a very difficult night from the third to the, um, sorry, I'm, I'm, from, from the fourth to the fifth of so Tuesday to Wednesday where there were a lot of clashes with the police um, and, and some of the activists also were detained. Um, and uh, the peaceful protest when it reached uh, the square, which is really important in this sort of complexity is that they, there were clashes with the police that tried to tame them. But then um, the, the, the clashes led to, to, to the emergence and escalation of a particular violence that we still have to sort of understand in its own complexity. And then on the sixth, which is on the fifth and the sixth, which is very important, that uh, violence escalated beyond um, the effects of the sort of like, you know, uh, of, the, of, the, of the groups that, that could organize it. And also we could not see the, the typical sort of organization of the protest in Almaty anymore because all sorts of groups collided. There were all types of people who went on the streets to voice their grievances. They tried to sort of collect um, the types of slogans that they were standing for, political reforms were at the fore their economic situation and worsening economic conditions were also uh, voiced. But then what is also important is that um, the peaceful rally, the peaceful protest was hijacked by highly violent groups um, of variety of background that we still, again, need to sort of clarify and study in more detail because there's still a lot of uncertainty and disinformation coming from all sorts of sources. Who were these people? And, uh, and I'm happy to address the complexity in Q&A further on and why this complexity of, of sort of disinformation happens. But then also what is very important is that um, despite like, you know, in this complexity, basically, there the were these violent groups of all sorts go ongoing and doing. And then equally at the same time, there was a peaceful protest in, in Almaty happening up until the end of the 6th and, and even 7th of, of January, where a lot of sort of peaceful protests, that, that's what, where we saw the huge transparency and sort of like, you know, the, the type of slogan saying we are not terrorists, we are peaceful protesters. Um, and unfortunately, uh, again, some of them were injured or uh, died and, and sort of the type of violence that emerged. But I think these these are the things that are very important to understand precisely if we, if we separate Almaty protests from all the like, events that happened elsewhere. And I think we need to sort of for clarity, I know there will be some research coming out of that in the coming months and years, but for the clarity, we need to separate it into what sort of happened on the ground in Almaty. Why was it hijacked? 
uh, by these violent groups? What were the type of actors involved in it? Of course, we cannot sort of underestimate all types of groups uh, thinking about the political conflict that is happening within the regime itself and the types of, uh, again, arrests that I'm sure my colleagues will, will, will talk about in more detail. Um, but also we, when we're thinking about the inter-regime or inter-elite um, sort of uh, struggle, power struggles and so on and so forth, we also should not forget that uh, the protest started and initially was very genuine. Uh, and what I've, you know, what I've been talking about quite a lot in, in, in my forthcoming work is that unfortunately, because these group of groups of activists were not allowed to institutionalize into formal um, groups such as like you know political parties who could run for particular elections, who could stand even in local elections, or who could you know formalize somehow their activities. Um, and they were sort of left in two very distinct conditions, both uh, the Jean Baladma my group, uh, the old sort of parts of opposition that was completely sort of diminished uh, by 2019, that the, the former opposition that, that kind of like stopped, um, ceased to exist, but, but still there were parts of it, like, you know, parts of uh, the types of people who were still on the ground, who were still engaged in the type of sort of oppositional messages, but there was, there was no institutionalization. And then the type of social movements that refused to institutionalize precisely because they don't want to play by the rules of the game that the regime offered them. So we really need to look into this complexity of actors. And when we're focusing on, on sort of like what happened within the regime, we also should not forget get sort of like what happens on the non-regime level. Um, as a sociologist, again, I, I would problematize the idea of, of society here. I would look more into sort of groups and communities within society. It's not homogeneous as well. Neither the protests nor the, the groups uh, who, who particularly took part in it were homogeneous. So even though I think um, some of us are expecting, you know, very uh, straightforward answers, and I hope, I, I wish I could offer them. I think uh, for me, the answer right now, at least the direction would be not to avoid this type of complexity and sort of multi-layeredness of both actors, the spaces, localities, and also of the forces that were happening, like, you know, consistently at the same time, while there was huge violence, there was also peaceful protests. While there were like, you know, uh, clashes with the police, there was also um, a lot of solidarity expressed uh, on the ground. So I don't think we need to like, you know, um, take sides, first of all, or try to painted as black and white, here's the enemy, here's the, you know, the one who, the group we should support and so on and so forth. We really need to address it in the in the complexity of what is happening. I think I went a little bit over time, so I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana, for this really great uh, uh, putting the scene on the <laughs> in place. That's really a, a terrific way of, of uh, looking at what happened. And uh, Dosim Satpayev was able to, to join us uh, from Almaty, director of the, the risk assessment group. So Dosim, I would like to give you the floor uh, to continue our discussion. <coughs> well. Hi, everybody. Well, thank you very much uh, for invitation. I'm very glad to see Marlene well. And yes, it's very important uh, topic. And now a lot of questions about the reasons of these events, about the participants of these events. Well, and I'd like to present my point of view. Well, <laughs> you, maybe you know, in Kazakhstan, we have now a lot of very big informational war between um, some expert audience and official propaganda <laughs> around these events, yes. Well, but uh, I'd like to start that uh, if we talk about the last uh, January events in Kazakhstan, we should remember that uh, protest moods exist in Kazakhstan for a long time. Well, you should remember that in Kazakhstan sometimes uh, where big explosion, social explosion in different regions of Kazakhstan. Well, 2006 in Almaty, 2011 in the western part of Kazakhstan, 2016 it was very, very, very active land protest in different regions of Kazakhstan. Well, uh, 2019, if you remember, after the presidential election in Kazakhstan was a lot of action of protest demonstration. Well, in, uh, in uh, 2019 appeared a lot of uh, uh, young, uh, new young leaders. Well, and it was very good trends if we talk about the future of Kazakh opposition movement. Well, and if we return to the uh, action of protest in January, in, 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 in to, to January uh, of this year, Yes, I quite agree with previous speaker. Well, the social explosion uh, that happened in the Western part of Kazakhstan uh, 
was very close connected with very bad social economical situation, not only in Western part of Kazakhstan, but in different regions of our country. Well, I'd like to uh, emphasize, if we talk about the Kazakh economy, uh, we should remember that we have only some donor, donors of Kazakh budget. This is Almaty city and Western part of Kazakhstan. If we talk about the another regions of Kazakhstan, this is depressive regions. Well, this is regions receives money from the budget. Well, it means that uh, in these regions we have a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of big problems uh, with education, culture, infrastructure, with uh, um, uh, wo uh, uh, workplaces, and and uh, etc. Well, uh, I'd like to say that uh, uh, in the first stage. Uh, in January, uh, we saw peaceful action of protest. And uh, after that, we saw very big wave of peaceful action of protest in different city of Kazakhstan and in Almaty too. Well, in the first stage in Almaty, we saw peaceful uh, demonstration, uh, but in the second stage of this uh, process, uh, we can see very interesting, um, uh, interesting uh, uh, events because uh, uh, I'd like to say that uh, to the peaceful protest uh, in Almaty uh, were joined uh, by internal migrants uh, from other regions of uh, Kazakhstan and uh, young people from uh, suburbs of Almaty city. Well, uh, the most part of them, this is unemployed, un unemployed young people. Uh, and another part, they uh, are engaged in low skilled work and receive very low wages. Well, uh, Marlene, maybe you remember when I was in Washington 2015, well, I presented to you our book, well, uh, Cocktail Molotov. Well, this book we published in Kazakhstan uh, 2014, and this book we devoted uh, to such kind of young people. We tried to understand why in Kazakhstan uh, appeared lost generation and what level of social aggression we can see in this kind of social groups. And I'd like to say that uh, this is social aggression that we saw in Almaty, very close connected with these young people. Well, it's not extremists, it's not terrorists, it's our citizens, it's our local people. Well, it's lost generation, but unfortunately our power for a long time, they don't, don't, didn't say about uh, these people. Well, they prefer to close eyes to the problems of lost generation. But I'd like to say what, uh, for example, KPMG uh, recently, well, calculated that uh, 162 people uh, in Kazakhstan own 55% uh, of the country's wealth. It's very interesting that today, for example, uh, Mr. Tokayev, well, uh, repeated these figures. And uh, he said that the half of the population receives a little more $100 a month. Well, but I'd like to say that it's not new information for us because for a long time we talk about about it well and uh, but uh, one year ago for example in our youtube channel auditorium kz we prepare a special uh, report special uh, issue called why are there so many poor people in kazakhstan and in this report for example we focused a lot of attention to the child poverty Yes, it's very big problems in Kazakhstan, child poverty, because, uh, for example, uh, among the 6 million uh, children in Kazakhstan, 1 million children live in poor families. And this is a situation, I believe, has threatened to create a new lost generation from among this, uh, those children who have already become a uh, hostage of their parents' poverty. Well. And it means that in next 10 years, ne next 15 years, in Kazakhstan will appear a new basis for social aggression. Will, will appear a new basis for uh, uh, new uh, young people who will be social outsider in Kazakhstan. Well, it means it will be a basis for new social exposure. It's very important uh, point of view. 
well uh, but uh, I don't trust uh, two official figures that uh, Mr. Tokayev mentioned about the two uh, 20,000 terrorists and bandits who attacked Almaty. Well, it's very strange figures. Let's look, for example, to Taliban movement. <laughs> well, unofficial, well, we have some unofficial figures that uh, Taliban movement, for example, they have maybe 60,000, uh, 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 maybe from 60,000 till 80,000 uh, militants and uh, soldier in Taliban army. Well, it means that uh, 20,000 uh, extremists and bandits, well, it's a, it's a quarter of Taliban army. But where is these people? We haven't concrete evidence. We haven't concrete uh, uh, information about uh, these extremists and terrorists. Well, it's my point of view that these figures appeared because Mr. Tokayev tried to attract uh, collective security treatment organization. Well, uh, treat organization, uh, quality of security organization, because in this inter elite conflict for Mr. Tokayev was very important to receive support from Mr. Putin because uh, Tokayev didn't trust to law enforcement, he didn't trust to secret service, and he didn't trust to army. Well, uh, maybe he has some trust to police, but uh, I am not sure. And uh, second reason why Mr. Tokayev try to use this is very terrible figures, 20,000 extremists and bandits. Well, because uh, it was very important to show to all world that uh, uh, he tried to save Almaty from external aggression. Well, it means that uh, appearance uh, organization of quality of security in Kazakhstan have some legitimacy. Well, and uh, uh, yes, now we can see that uh, uh, connection between Mr. Tokayev and Putin now maybe more close. <laughs> well, in compare, for example, uh, with last year. Well, and in, in Kazakhstan, for example, in some articles, I emphasized that unfortunately, when uh, Mr. Tokayev uh, tried to receive assistance from Mr. Putin, uh, we can see the end of history of Kazakh, traditional Kazakh multivectoral foreign policy. It's my point of view. And after that, I believe that Mr. Tokayev will be more close uh, cooperated with Mr. Putin in some internal and foreign affairs. Okay, uh, but uh, if we talk about the intra-elite uh, conflict, I'd like to say that it wasn't conflict between Nazarbayev and Tokayev. No, it was conflict between Tokayev and some people in the closest circle of Mr. Nazarbayev. Well, uh, I believe maybe if you remember last year in international community was very big scandals connected with, uh, 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 well, it's, it's called Pegaso scandals. When some secret services in different countries, they used Israeli technology for a spy for a secret work against politicians, against journalists, against uh, some um, members of uh, civil society organization. Well, in Kazakhstan, uh, it was uh, the same big scandals because uh, we received information that uh, Mr. Tokayev, yes, he was under the control of this Pegasus technology. Well, not only Mr. Tokai, but another members of uh, um, uh, Kazakh political elite. And uh, as far as I understood, uh, Mr. Karim Asimov, yes, last year, well, he was one of the main person who as a head of Committee of National Security, he can to use this is secret technology Pegasus for uh, increasing control to uh, another members of uh, Kazakh political and business elite. And I believe maybe last year it was some black hat between Tokayev and Karim Masimov. Okay, well, uh, uh, why, for example, Mr. Karim Masimov decided to organize some uh, state cop against, against uh, Mr. Tokayev? Well, um, uh, we should to look to the person of Mr. Nazarbay because last year from 28 December, Mr. Nazarbay disappeared. Well, we remember that he participated in St. Petersburg summit, but he, we saw that in the summit, it was very bad health. <laughs> well, uh, we saw this picture. Well, Mr. Nazarbayev, he has very weak, uh, he was very weak and uh, Mr. Lukashenko supported him. <laughs> well, and I believe that from 28 December 
till uh, 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 18 January. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Nazarbayev, uh, I believe he he had very big he had, he has he has very big problems with health, and I believe some circle uh, close circle uh, uh, of Mr. Nazarbayev he believes that maybe uh, Mr. Nazarbayev will die. And uh, I believe that uh, Karim Asimov and some supporters from uh, members of first president, they decided, okay, uh, we should to uh, organize some um, very great kick to Mr. Tokayev. Well, and maybe we should to uh, use, this is destabilization situation in Kazakhstan for own intra elite conflict. Well, because uh, last Dosim, year- can example, I ask you yeah. to, to summarize and, and conclude? Okay, 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 okay. Well, I'd like to say that uh, last year, Nazarbayev uh, declared that he is going to hand position of pro presidential party in Rotan to Mr. Tokayev. It means that Nazarbayev decided to support Tokayev in next presidential election. Well, uh, it, it will be 2024. Well, and I believe uh, some people in closest circle of uh, Nazarbayev, they decided, okay, uh, it's not very good for us because maybe Nazarbayev decided to support Tokayev for as a as a long term figures political figures well and i believe it's one of the basis of this conflicts well and i believe that in future we'll saw new conflicts we'll see new conflicts because mr tokayev he's not very young person well he's 68 years old well and uh, nobody know what will happen if for example tomorrow will mr tokayev will be some problem with health because you, do you remember Mr. President, uh, uh, President of Turkmenistan, Saparmuriyat Niyazov? He has died, but he, he was only 66 years old. <laughs> well, it means that uh, unfortunately now, political system of Kazakhstan is not very stable. Intra-elite uh, relationship is not very stable. And our prospect is not very clear. Well, in different sphere, economical sphere, political sphere, and intra-elite uh, relation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dosim, for your uh, uh, insights to, to the discussion. I now would like to give the floor to uh, uh, Azamat, who is also in Almaty now. Right. Uh, thank you, Marlene. Uh, thank you, Central Asia Program and GW. Thank you to the other participants and, of course, to our audience. Um, I'm originally from Almaty, Kazakhstan. I teach sociology in California and I do research on public opinion in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. It just so happened that for this winter break, I traveled to Almaty um, and I got caught in these events. And in a way, looking back, I'm glad I was here as these events unfolded. And obviously, just like everyone else in the country, I've been trying so hard to understand what happened and what does it mean. And so I will share my thoughts as of now. And it's quite possible that, you know, as more information becomes available, uh, my thoughts will evolve as well, but this is what it looks like to me. So to make sense of what happened, I think we should go back in time just a little bit. So background, important background, in my opinion. President Nazarbayev has always been eager to project a, a positive image of himself in the international arena. In a 2016 interview with journalists from Bloomberg who traveled to Astana, he stated that he made no arrangements to transfer power to his children, to use his words, Наследственность моих детей я не предусматриваю. Я думаю, что это не для нас. Right? Yet, as I argued in a 2020 Ponar's memo, Kazakhstan's unusual transition format announced in March 2019 was designed to avoid the Uzbek scenario, wherein President Karimov's unexpected passing in 2016 severely disrupted the status quo in Tashkent and beyond. And if this transition were to succeed in Kazakhstan, it would secure the future of those who acquired great wealth and power during Nazarbayev's long rule, including certainly his family members, while avoiding the appearance of dynastic power transfer, the kind we saw in Azerbaijan. To put it simply, you can think of this as an attempt to have the cake and to eat it as well, right? So to this end, Tokayev's power was severely curtailed with Nazarbayev retaining control over the entire security apparatus as lifelong chair of the Security Council and chair of the Northern political party, among other posts. That Tokayev's power was very limited was hardly a secret. 
right? For anyone who cared to look, certainly was not lost on anyone in Kazakhstan, right? The insulting handle, maybe, right? Furniture became part of common parlance when describing the extent of the Kaev's power, despite his post as Kazakhstan's second president. And I believe that given the zero sum nature of Kazakhstan's uh, patronage based politics, any effort, any effort by Tokayev to strengthen his own position and chart his own course was always going to lead to conflict with the very elites whose interests this transition was designed to safeguard. So that's the background. Now my thoughts on what actually happened. So to put things plainly, in my opinion, Kazakhstan just experienced an attempted coup aimed at overthrowing President Tokayev. I believe it is analytically important to distinguish between three different groups of participants. Number one, group number one, peaceful protesters, just like uh, the previous speaker said, peaceful protesters with legitimate social and economic demands, first in the west of the country, then in Almaty and the other cities. Number two, opportunistic looters, criminals who ransacked retail outlets, broke into ATMs, or simply helped themselves to gasoline from a looted gas station in Almaty on January 7th, for instance, right? I, but there was another group, right? Group number three, which are organized provocateurs who incited the storming of government buildings, burned down Amadi City Hall, presidential residence, TV stations, repeatedly attacked police precincts and distributed firearms. So of these three groups, the first two groups are hardly unique to Kazakhstan, right? You think about any large scale protest in any country in the world, you will have people who are there for you know, the idea's sake, right? They're definitely nonviolent, right? You have opportunists who are just trying to steal stuff and, you know, grab things for free, right? But it's the presence of the third group. And I think it's hard to deny the presence of the third group. I agree with uh, Dosim completely that, you know, the number 20,000 is ridiculous, right? It's just not based in reality, but certainly there was a presence of the third group and uh, also the geographic scope and the coordinated nature of the attacks against government facilities, it is consistent with the view that what happened was more than just a, an organic protest that sort of spun out of control, right? So I do think it's important to distinguish between these three groups. So my sense, again, after sort of thinking about this nonstop for, you know, just like everyone else here, I think that by attacking and destroying major government facilities in multiple cities throughout Kazakhstan, the plotters aimed to demonstrate Tokayev's failure to bring the security situation under control. A fearless local journalist, Ms. Gulnara Bashkenova of Orda KZ, reported that as the events escalated, Tokayev was actually told to record a video address announcing his own resignation, but he did not comply with that demand, obviously. It is important to note that the government has yet to produce credible evidence of foreign involvement in the unrest. Instead, we have seen embarrassingly ham-fisted efforts to prove foreign involvement that just imploded, right? So the Bishkek jazz musician, jazz pianist case, I think is on everyone's mind, but there are also less high profile cases as well. We can only speculate at this point, and I'd love to hear thoughts of the other participants about this, about why the government feels the pressure to push this narrative of foreign involvement. I mean, it certainly could be the price of help from Putin, right? That you need to talk about the foreign involvement or even the specter of you know, color revolutions and whatnot. However ridiculous and divorced from reality that actually is. In any event, I believe it is essential to find out the true identities of the plotters. In my opinion, the idea that Mr. Masimov, an ethnic Uyghur, was acting on his own accord to seize power in Kazakhstan defies logic, defies reason, defies history. Uh, in trying to make sense of the events of early January, I am reminded of the phrase attributed to Sir Winston Churchill. Kremlin political intrigues are comparable to a bulldog fight under a rug. An outsider only hears the growling, and when he sees the bones fly out from beneath, it is obvious who won. Well, we know who won, right? Tokayev did, at least this round, he did, with the help certainly from Putin. The mystery, really the mystery, right, is who lost. 
But honestly, it's kind of a dangerous question to ask in Kazakhstan right now, who lost? We all dance around it, but uh, it is a dangerous question. But perhaps for clues that may help us solve this mystery of who lost, we got to look at the bones that are flying from under the proverbial rug. And the bones are flying from under the rug with sort of terrifying speed, right? So for those following the news of high profile firings and resignations coming out of Kazakhstan, there are certainly lots of bones to analyze. I think that it's uncontroversial to say that there are far fewer relatives and close allies of President Nazarbayev in the corridors of power today than they were just one month ago. It could all be just a remarkable coincidence. I don't know. Anyway, challenges for the future. I very much hope that we will learn the truth before too long, but I'm not going to hold my breath for public confessions of guilt, et cetera. It is quite possible that an agreement has been reached to protect the identities of the true coup leaders. And maybe it was the right thing to do. Maybe it was a rational, reasonable course of action. Maybe it was the price of help from Putin and CSTO. Honestly, we may never find out. However, as a Kazakh, right, as someone who has family in Kazakhstan, I'm really worried about whether genuine reforms, which Kazakhstan so desperately needs, are possible without an honest reckoning with the recent events. If for the sake of peace and stability, at least in the short term, this reckoning never happens, does this lie by omission becomes a crucial birth defect of new Kazakhstan that Takayev now talks about, right? Similarly, there are more and more horrible reports coming out about the deaths of nonviolent protesters and civilians in Almaty on January 6th. I'm sure all the participants know about this, right? So again, can the new Kazakhstan be built on the foundation of lies about the actions of the army and law enforcement? Whether or not there will be political will to conduct thorough investigations and hold those responsible accountable is to me hugely important. And lastly, of course, only time will show what the true price is for Kazakhstan that Kazakhstan will need to pay for Putin's help, right? Only time is gonna show that. In any event, Kazakhstan now has a rare opportunity, however small, for genuine political reforms. The fear in Kazakhstan, of course, is that, you know, ничего не изменится, right? Nothing will change. The next several months will tell us whether cautious optimism about the future is warranted. Thank you. Thank you so much, Azamat, for these great, great uh, uh, remarks. I now would like to give the floor to Denisa. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for um, having me uh, in this event. Um, I um, wanted to um, start by sort of uh, by quoting uh, Nazarbayev uh, in, his, um, in his video speech. Um, speaking from the position of the authoritarian leader who ruled the country for 30 years, he has said, mm, well, um, this, uh, this difficulty, we will overcome this difficulty and we will emerge stronger. And I think this is a good sort of entry point to think about the future of Kazakhstan. So I'm trying to uh, sort of, I, I, I want to wait a little bit uh, to put some time, some time between the, uh, uh, ourselves and the events uh, to see sort of a larger picture. But at this point, I think we might start thinking about what does this either failed coup or clan war or uh, suppressed nationwide sort of revolution or extrication of the family, of the ruling family from, from the uh, um, uh, corridors of power, what does it bring uh, to the country? Um, <clears throat> I'm a political economist by training and uh, sort of I want to analyze this personalistic autocracy that um, Nazarbayev has built over the years, over decades in Kazakhstan from the position of the sort of the resource flows and the uh, resource management in order to build and support this autocratic regime. So of uh, these uh, personalistic autocracy, 
uh, had been built um, uh, around the formal institutions that actually reinforce and make use of the patron-client relationship. Those institutions, they uh, sort of create opportunities and reinforce systemic corruption. They nearly legalize systemic corruption. And uh, they are also the institutions that uh, use the, um, the rents, the mineral rents, in order to um, redistrib uh, distribute them uh, in the society in the top-down manner, with most of those resources accumulating at the top. So is that kind of um, state, is that kind of um, um, regime, political regime, uh, is it likely to change in the aftermath of what we saw earlier this month? And my uh, sort of my intuition is that the answer to this question is no. This kind of regime, this kind of, um, this kind of um, uh, kleptocratic, um, uh, oppressive authoritarian regime is not going to change with um, Nazarbayev uh, sort of um, relinquishing the remnants of his power. <clears throat> so, um, and uh, I will try to give you some reasons why I sort of said some, some sort of um, uh, considerations for why I believe that the answer is no. There had been no new, genuinely new people in the new government that Takayev appointed, right? So all those reshuffles in the cabinet, in the key ministries, they're, they are repla the replacements are done with the Nazarbayev era cronies, right? Those are the people who were raised in, our, uh, in, uh, in uh, the kleptocratic autocracy, uh, went through the ranks and they, 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 there are reshuffles, there is no indication that there are new people. Um, they, um, we have no indication uh, that Takayev um, envisions any political reforms. In his speech uh, to Majlis, he didn't mention any political reforms, only economic and sort of state structural reforms. Um, and with that, I don't believe there will be any mechanisms to control the systemic corruption because only transparency and accountability of the government will uh, bring the end to the systemic corruption of the regime. There, they they, I don't see there is any promise for the oligarchic property redistribution. Azamat is correct that we see a lot of uh, sort of very close cronies of Nazarbayev, sort of the Nazar, uh, his immediate family and his really close associates uh, been extricated from uh, from uh, the uh, from the political um, uh, positions. However, there hadn't been any calls for actually stripping them of their assets. Right? Uh, uh, Taka, uh, Takayev made announcements about the state divest divestment and the uh, renationalization or re uh, nationalization of this operator. Rob, um, uh, the company that collected sort of the quasi tax uh, from uh, from the uh, auto um, um, sort of from the car uh, imports, um, and I think those are those those announcements about uh, sort of uh, uh, about. Um, uh, reforms of uh, the move on, uh, of um, of the uh, state um, holdings of the specific companies, I think they are likely to have the purpose of appeasement of protesters' demands. Um, I want to um, sort of uh, to uh, bring up an important uh, sort of um, important sort of uh, um, event that. Uh, not event, a series of mobilization that preceded the January protests. Um, they, we have seen in December in Kazakhstan, there was enormous amount of uh, sort of controversy and mass mobilization, uh, including uh, the civil society organizations, even the regional chambers of entrepreneurs were opposing and uh, sort of proposing some ways to address this raise in these quasi tax collected by the uh, by the private um, by the private uh, corporation. I also think that um, as an immediate sort of reaction to the protest, 
we will see intensification of political repression in the country. And I think this is the most sort of unfortunate and um, sad consequence of, uh, of the protests. Um, the regime has used the tactic, the tactic of uh, extra legal violence, uh, such as assassinations, criminal, criminal persecution, imprisonment and torture in the past. And I think that trend will continue uh, with, uh, with sort of these uh, months protests. They kind of give, um, um, they, they can be used to, to justify the uh, escalation of, uh, of repression. In terms of the international position uh, of the country, I don't think the events have changed it. And I see in the chat that there are questions about uh, sort of uh, the, uh, CSTO role and uh, you know what does it all mean for the international position of Kazakhstan? I think it had been a common knowledge that uh, Nazarbayev's regime for decades was supported um, by by or backed by um, uh, by Russia uh, by Russian support. Um, it had always, it had often been discussed in terms of personal loyalty and personal agreements because between Nazarbayev and Putin. Um, but I think, um, and uh, I will echo the words of uh, Carnegie Center of Russia director Alexander Balnov, uh, who said that the relationships between Kazakhstan leadership uh, by, uh, by Russian leadership and its allies are not are not personal but institutional. And I think the use of um, CSTO um, troops uh, uh, this month uh, is a good sort of good evidence of that. So um, the um, if we um, if we try to make sense of what actually happened. Uh, this month um, and put it in a larger perspective. I think that ultimately we will need to agree that uh, the protests, although they're quite um, sort of, um, they, they um, might, might appear quite unexpected and unique to, um, to, to an outside observer. I think that they fit, the, those protests fit nicely in the larger patterns of bottom-up mobilization that we've seen in uh, Kazakhstan. And I sort of, I, I will echo um, um, Diana's and uh, Azamat's uh, sort of points on that. Um, uh, so, it, um, uh, and Dosim, uh, Dosim's points on that. So they, the mobilization is quite similar to what we've seen in just now in uh, 2011, uh, protests around, uh, around land privatization 2016. So, they're, they're um, sort of genuine, they had been a genuine element to those protests. But they also, uh, in all those previous uh, events, we've also seen uh, that third sort of um, group of protesters that um, Azamat talked about it, uh, about. And uh, it's really hard to put a label on that third violent um, group that have joined protests, um, uh, in uh, in Almaty, um, and uh, sort of they perpetuate uh, violence. Uh, they perhaps are close to criminal elements. Uh, they are basically non uh, ununiformed uh, provocateurs, right? So those are uh, so th this is the label I would like to use. They are provocateurs. They disrupt the protest. Uh, they um, they instigate violence, and they basically they delegitimize uh, the protests uh, by committing those acts of violence. So um, those protests sort of uh, continue to put it in a larger perspective. They also arose on the wave of sharpening social grievances, right? So for uh, the, the way the protests were reported was that they were sort of immediate reaction to the uh, liquefied petroleum gas uh, price increase. However, I want again, go back to that, uh, to, to that mobilization, wave of mobilization around these, um, this quasi tax um, uh, collection increase uh, of the rate of that uh, quasi tax on uh, imported uh, imported uh, cars, but it also goes that tax goes also uh, on packaging. Um, so these they had been 
um, mobilization in December. And I think what we saw with the rise of prices for petroleum, um, liquefied petroleum gas was just like the, the last drop to, to that sea of social grievances. Um, so uh, the, the, I, I want to sort of go on and um, um, so, so uh, the point that I want to make is that by no means those protests were unexpected, right? So um, they they uh, came around um, sort of this um, exacerbation uh, of uh, competition for the uh, for the rents created by the country's natural resources. Um, COVID recession affected both the state and private sector. And Nazarbayev's family, his close cronies, continued to squeeze the revenues out of the already impoverished people through those um, uh, quasi-state mechanisms, the operator uh, ROP, uh, and also the uh, LPG gas uh, tariff in uh, state-dominated, non-competitive sector. All right. So, um, <clears throat> Sorry, can you conclude? Let me wrap, uh, yeah. wrap it up. Uh, and um, um, so, I um, I uh, wanted to sort of return back to uh, what exactly um, had happened um, uh, this month in uh, in Kazakhstan, and I think. Um, sort of, I don't buy uh, into this narrative of failed uh, coup attempt. I think that the events that uh, unraveled uh, before our, uh, our eyes can be characterized as, these as the final accord in the power transition of the uh, personalistic dictatorship, right? So I think this is the way for the Nazarbayev family to, uh, to, to uh, flee the scene um, in the in the wake of the popular protest against their rule, um, but at the same time retain all the assets that they um, milked out of Kazakhstan. You know that uh, by some accounts, uh, Nazarbayev's family owns between hundred to hundred fifty billion dollars, right? So if that uh, wealth is to be redistributed uh, across the entire population of Kazakhstan, uh, people who live now on $15 a day will triple their incomes. So I will stop uh, at this point. Thank you so much, Denisa, for, for sharing your thought. And I now would like to give the floor to Bruce. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, first, you know, obviously, my thanks to the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard and the Oxford Society and all my uh, bright and talented friends there for sponsoring this event. And Marlene, thank you and George Washington University for hosting it. Uh, and um, I want to express my sympathies and condolences to Kazakhstan's people for all the hard times they've gone through this year. Um, you know, I'm glad we're talking about protests. I'm going to deal specifically with protests in Kazakhstan. Um, you know, the peaceful protests that started all these events uh, that we're now seeing in, um, in Kazakhstan have kind of taken the background. They're, they're the lead into reports about intra-elite struggles and, uh, you know, who's, who, so we're watching who's moving out of government, who's being moved out of government, who's moving into government. Um, you know, once the peaceful protests had really gained some steam and they were uh, spreading it across the country. Takayev made some concessions. You know, he he ordered the fuel price that we heard that was increased. He said, cut that in less than half of what it was. Uh, he accepted the resignation of the government on January fifth. Uh, by which time violence was breaking out in some cities around Kazakhstan. He uh, he promised that there would be political forms reforms. Excuse political reforms, which he said would be published soon. Uh, but the story of, of peaceful protests in Kazakhstan then, you know, turned and we, as we've heard, uh, it became a story about burning buildings and cars burning and, and shooting and Almaty and Taraz and Shimkent and other places. Uh, and when Takayev removed first president Nursultan Nazarbayev from the post of secretary of the Security Council and sacked Karim Masimov as head of the National Security Committee, it became increasingly clear that there was some sort of struggle for power going on in the government. Takayev said foreign trained terrorists were behind the destruction. We've heard about that and gave the shoot to kill order uh, and called on the Russian Collective Security Treaty Organization to send troops to Kazakhstan. And increasingly lost in the story of what was happening in Kazakhstan um, was the peaceful protest. And the peaceful protesters 
uh, like the ones in Almaty that Diana mentioned at the start, who stood outside holding banners and said, we're just ordinary people and we're not terrorists. Um, their peaceful protests had called for change in the way the country was run. Shaw Kett, get out, old man, was one of the most commonly heard chants at protests. And though it was specifically targeted at Nazarbayev, it was more broadly aimed at the system that developed when Nazarbayev was president. The unbridled greed of members of Nazarbayev's family and Nazarbayev's close associates, the unwillingness of authorities to genuinely tackle the economic problems of so many people in Kazakhstan, and the inability of people to play a meaningful role in, the go in governing their country. Beyond the vague promise of reforms, Takaya was also pledged to raise, raise wages and work to keep costs of basic goods down. Takaya will raise wages and keep costs down of necessity, rather than a genuine desire to bring prosperity to all the people of Kazakhstan. Takaya seemingly has just survived a battle to remove him from power, and we've no idea if the battle is, that battle is over. But without the support of the people, or barring that, at least some weeks of quiet, he still could have a lot of problems trying to govern the country. But while we can expect more concessions from the government to Kazakhstan's people in the coming weeks and months, there's not much reason to think the country will enter a more progressive era. In fact, the ability to protest, for example, might become much more difficult six months or a year from now. <clears throat> it is the habit of Central Asian governments that when unrest breaks out and after some semblance of order has been restored, that they make a few immediate concessions to the people, but they do not look for long-term solutions to the socioeconomic or political causes that led to the unrest in the first place. Instead, these governments focus on the lapses in security that allowed the unrest to start and gain momentum. For example, in Kazakhstan, <clears throat> and we've heard there were protests uh, after Takayev's appointment as acting president in March 2019, and again before and after he was his subsequent victory in the snap elections in June. After the protests, authorities said that they were willing to, they created a, a national council of public trust, I believe, and they, they taught, said there were going to be a listening government. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it seemed to it make, hint that they were willing to have an, some kind of dialogue with society. But instead, what we ended up with was an increase in the use of preemptive detentions of activists and rally organizers ahead of planned protests, even when they were unsanctioned, and kettling was introduced to in, intimidate people who attended demonstrations. Kazakh authorities make a, a distinction between protests. There are political protests that criticize the government and call for changes, and there are protests over socioeconomic conditions. Authorities usually end the political protests quickly. We've seen that they block off squares, they bring in busloads of uh, Amon troops and, and police are all over the town when they know there's gonna be a protest or demonstration. Um, now this is especially true when these protests are called for uh, by fugitive banker and former Kazakh official Mukhtar Blaza, the leader of the Democratic Choice of Kazakhstan, which is not only banned, but officially designated as an extremist group, although there's little evidence to suggest it's actually extremist. Um, in fact, many demonstrations that have little or nothing to do with Ablazov are broken up on the pretext that he's supposedly involved. That problem will probably now be multiplied. One result of the power struggle, as we've heard, is it produced losers, losers with access to large amounts of money. Whether people tied to Nazarbayev's family or informal power brokers, including criminal groups that thrived and enriched themselves when Nazarbayev was leader, will such people simply be content with the riches that they have acquired, in which some may lose in the coming months, or will they seek to undo what has just been done? It's something that the Kyiv government will have to think about every time there's a protest, and it gives this government additional reason not to allow any protests at all. Kazakh authorities have been more lenient in dealing with protests over socioeconomic conditions. One result of the oil worker strike in West Asia in Jano was then in 2011, when 17 people were killed in December, finally after months of protests, was that the Kazakh government became more willing to negotiate with people demanding better working conditions or social benefits and give the protesters at least some of what they were, what they were demanding. Mothers with many children, mortgage holders who took out loans and hard currency before the tanga dropped precipitously in value, and others have demonstrated, other groups have demonstrated that uh, you can receive some of what you want if you're willing to get out there and demonstrate. Labor strikes have been similarly, similarly effective. And at this point, I wanna thank the Oxford Society for their protest tractor on, tractor on their website because the tractor shows the drastic increase in labor strikes, especially in 2021. And most of these happened in Western Kazakhstan where the, the recent protests started. The, Kazakhs, the Kazakh government's tactic of giving in partially to demands for higher wages, better working conditions or social benefits really set the stage for what just happened and are heard in Takayev's 
complaint during recent protests that the price of fuel had been lowered and the government dismissed, so why were the protests continuing? Protests over socioeconomic conditions always bring the risk to authorities of becoming protests for greater political rights or changes in government personnel. And protests, protest, huh, and protests have been doing exactly that in Western Kazakhstan in recent months. At one labor strike last summer in Jano Ozan, deputies from the provincial administration came to meet with oil workers demanding higher wages. The striking workers rejected the meeting with the deputies, saying the, saying the deputies had not been elected by the people. That's just what happened in Jano Ozen in Octao when the Mangustau governor attempted to negotiate with protesters. Takaya faces some serious problems in the months ahead. Securing his position as head of state, dealing with whoever his opponents were during the recent infighting in government, and ensuring more protests don't start that could lead to a repeat of nation, nation, uh, nationwide protests that we just saw, none of which had anything to do with supporting Takayev, of course. Uh, but I would say the tolerance for public assembly, be it labor strikes or political protests, will be very low in the near future. But the desire for pro such protests won't diminish at all. And one thing I would mention in my last remarks here is that you know, people were out to, to get some social justice and they wanted to see the people responsible for stealing all that money from Kazakhstan for all those years brought to justice for all this. Now we've seen that the Naz members of the Nazarbayev family have had some reversals in their fortunes. The sons-in-law have had to leave prominent positions they had in companies, social organizations. Um, but there's been absolutely no hint that the government attempts to prosecute any of them or the big elites in the country. This is what the protesters wanted. That's what they expect to see. Somebody's got to, somebody's got to be put forward as, as one of the people that's been responsible for 30 years of corruption. And, and we've seen no, absolutely no effort on the part of Takayev's government so far to hold any of those people to account, except for Masimo. But he's by far one of the least offenders in this. Um, so it's going to be certainly something that I'm going to watch is what is the ability to protest publicly? What is the ability for public assembly, uh, considering all the bad things that have just happened, all the bad things that have happened over 30 years, uh, and the fact that we don't seem to be targeting any of the major offenders in any of all that. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bruce, for, for your uh, comments. Thank you all of you. They, they, we now have about half an hour for the Q&A, and there are a lot of questions, as you can imagine, going from um, every direction, foreign policy, domestic policy, the protester level, the, 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 the more kind of intra-elite level. Maybe let's begin by the, the, the foreign policy aspect and then move back to the, the, the domestic field. There are a lot of questions that are related to the uh, um, CSCO actions, how we can interpret that, how the, that was um, the, the, the foreign terrorist narrative is, was part of what was needed to get the CSTO uh, uh, involved. Can we have any idea of what would be the price for Tokayev's regime or for Kazakhstan globally to pay in, in, return, in return for uh, uh, Russia's uh, intervention? Do we have more uh, details on exactly how the uh, uh, CSTO troops were in charge of securing building but not acting in the street and do they have all uh, left so that's a kind of a package of uh, question and we also have question asking about the way China has been looking at the protest and at the CSTO intervention and also several questions uh, asking the, the, the same kind of question on, on the role of Turkey and uh, um, uh, the, the, the different Turkish regional uh, institution. So would some of you begin, would like to answer taking some of these questions and then we will move to more kind of a, a domestic uh, uh, aspect of the discussion. Denisa. Right, so uh, I think the, this uh, issue um, of um, CSTO um, uh, intervention had been mystified um, sort of, especially when it wasn't clear uh, whether the troops will stay. Now they're gone, and it's uh, it's a clear sort of, um, and it's a clear case in which um, Putin has sort of uh, gained some capital by using formal international mechanisms uh, for their actual 
purpose, right? So this is exactly for what the, that institution was created and was used for that purpose without immediate consequences. The troops were withdrawn, right? So I think um, I, I really want to uh, quote uh, Akishan Kajal-Gildin, uh, the uh, former prime minister of, uh, of uh, Kazakhstan from uh, 1990s, who in the interview said that um, Takayev didn't have other options uh, when faced with unsubordination of security services, he couldn't, he needed foreign assistance. He couldn't call NATO, he couldn't call uh, other international organizations because it would take months for anyone to come to his rescue. But uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, Russia was there and acted promptly and uh, sort of within the confines of this institution. So I don't think that we need to sort of mystify this involvement. Um, the, and again, uh, I think Russia gained some capital on this. Um, and so if there, if there are strings attached, but I think the strings had been attached from the moment that institution was created, not after it was used for the first time. Thank you, Denisa. Other comments? I just wanted to add that um, I think the decision to invite essentially Russian troops was predictably going to be hugely unpopular, right? So it's, I mean, close to political suicide for any politician who would try to basically bring Russian troops into Kazakhstan, right? But I think just like Dosim correctly pointed out, uh, Tokayev did not have much of a choice given that he had no confidence in the loyalty of the very security apparatus that you know was supposed to be uh, standing guard sort of uh, and so uh, the fact that the troops left is certainly great news for Kazakhstan the what the price to pay um, just I think informally it will be interesting to see um, how the conversations about uh, you know Russian built nuclear power plant will uh, continue from now on, whether the conversation about switching of the Kazakh uh, written language from Cyrillic to Latin alphabet, what happens to that conversation, it'll be interesting to see uh, how um, Tokayev moves with regard to the modernization of the Kazakh military. He recently gave several speeches saying we have completely outdated Soviet era equipment. We need to upgrade all the hardware. Right. So where do these contracts go? I think some of the early answers might be available soon. Thank you. Dosim, would you like to add something? Yes. You're muted, Dosim. You're muted. Sorry. Well, uh, very short comments. I'd like to uh, uh, repeat in my uh, report, I talked about it that um, uh, Collective uh, security treatment organization uh, uh, was invited to Kazakhstan, only one of the participants of intra elite conflicts. Well, this organization didn't participate in fighting against some terrorists, especially about the, against a big army of terrorists, because we haven't big army of terrorists in Kazakhstan. I mentioned 2000, uh, 20,000 extremists and bandits. This is mystification too. Yes, well, it means that uh, uh, this is organization, well, it's very, well, I believe it's very bad uh, trends because if we, do, if, we, if we look in the future, it means that Mr. Putin can't use this as military organization and one of the instrument of assistance to somebody in another countries, if this person will ask him, well, please help me, help me in my inter-elite conflicts. Okay, I can to imagine some cause for your invitation, it's like it's in Kazakhstan. Well, and I'd like to say that unfortunately, it it was well, it was was very big political mistake of Mr. Tokayev. Yes, I quite agree with Azamad because uh, in Kazakhstan, this is decision was very unpopular. Well, we should remember that uh, only in Kazakhstan, as a member of Eurasian Economic Union, for a long time we can see very strong anti-Putin moods not anti-Russian, anti-Putin moods, especially, especially after the events 2014, for example. Yes, 
And what uh, will be in future? Because national patriotic activity in Kazakhstan will increase, especially around the young Kazakh language people. And a lot of, of these people, they believe, well, Mr. Tokayev, he decided to, uh, uh, to sell our independence to Mr. Putin. A lot of young people uh, around the uh, inside of national patriotic uh, oriented movement, they believe that Mr. Tokayev now is like I say, Mr. Lukashenko. He's only such a lead of Mr. Putin. I believe it will be very big problems for Mr. Tokayev in future. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. So, and I wanted to add, oh, Bruce. Yes. You know, I, I then, would just, I would add one, you know, one thing real quick is that, you know, clearly that the decision to send in CSTO troops, at least it seems clear to me, was assigned to whoever was, uh, you know, the, the infighting in government in Kazakhstan, but that it was over and he was, he had picked a side and, and there was really no point in continuing this anymore because he had thrown his support behind Takaya. Um, you know, the, the strange thing about this for me always is that he was such a good friend of Nur Sultan Nazarbayev for so many years and treated him with so much respect. If I'm a leader of a CIS country or a country that's in the CSTO, um, I really got to wonder how much Putin's support and friendship is really worth. I mean, Nazar, certainly Nazarbayev's getting very lenient treatment. Uh, he's not being run out. He's not being dragged in front of, the, you know, into a courtroom or something like that. And that was undoubtedly part of the deal. But, you know, after all those years of Nazarbayev and Putin's being seen together and, and Putin saying what a great friend Nazarbayev was and stuff, and then um, he didn't support him, you know, uh, or this, at least Nazarbayev's side. It's something that, that I think, like I said, the other leaders got to consider uh, well, what is friendship with Putin worth exactly uh, if the chips are down? So, Sorry, Denisa, I last point on that. Uh, yeah, I wanted to build directly on Bruce's point. Uh, I think this is key, sort of, this is what we'll learn, how we'll learn about the nature of the relationship between the two countries, right? So it is not personal uh, friendship. It is the support for autocracy in the neighboring country, no matter who leads that autocracy. Thank you so much. Yeah, that, that's a very important point. Uh, let's now move to the, the, the more domestic side. Uh, we have several questions on elements that Bruce was mentioning at the end of his speech, uh, uh, the, the risk of repression <clears throat> on the activist culture globally uh, um, in, in Kazakhstan, and also a question on what is I mean, the, the legacy of the Kazakh Spring of 2019 and how the main figure of that we have uh, uh, seen being very active since, uh, uh, I mean, how this kind of, the lack of institutionalization of this movement, what can be the future of uh, uh, this aspect in what could be a more uh, a repressive environment and also a question about the so-called Islamist and the fact that we know that some uh, family members, of, some member of the Nazarbayev family, especially one of its uh, nephews, have kind of kind of connection or are kind of uh, patronizing or, or creating some of Islamist uh, uh, groups. So how do we articulate also that uh, uh, question? Let's go over these two elements. And if we still have time, we we'll discuss the reform. Diana, would you like to comment on the kind of the, the protest and the, the Kazakh spring aspect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much and thank you for bringing it. Um, yeah, we always need to clarify with the Kazakh Spring that it's about uh, in connection to the Prague Spring, not to the Arab Spring, because the, the people who were part of that movement uh, that I'm writing about in, in detail are the ones who, who believe in gradual change and reforms. And their voices, obviously, I mean, again, um, they started the protest in 2019. They continued raising this awareness of the fact that the laws need to change the laws quite significantly on the peaceful rallies that are provided by constitution. But there is a specific law just on, on rallies that actually prohibits that. And you need to get a you know, sanction from, from the specific uh, local administration in order to, to be able to express your peaceful rallies, which I think is really crucial. The law on uh, uh, sort of electing uh, parties and forming parties, which are currently constraining quite a lot of the sort of movements and, and different groups to be able to, to form a party and run and stand in the elections. I think all of these political reforms have constantly been on the, on the agenda. And I think what is important in the sort of complex um, sort of um, claims of, of the protests that we've seen in January is that it's precisely that from, from this very sort of um, complex, a lot of different groups involved, we need to go into a bit more uh, sustained and a very coherent agenda that in my opinion, again, I'm a political sociologist, I believe that it should be in, in many ways institutionalized for all of these voices and grievances and claims 
to be able to sit particularly within the socioeconomic strata, but also within their own groupness and to be able to claim them and to be represented through specific institutions, given that these institutions hopefully will start working at some point, but also for them to stop, um, you know, uh, being to stop putting themselves in danger because protest is the final, it's almost like a last resort for all of these people. And that's what we're really seeing from the ground is that a lot of people came out on the street despite of the fear, despite of the fact that they, you know, uh, they, they, they knew about repression, they know how the police state uh, and police um, itself works in Kazakhstan. We've seen that sort of, you know, level of repression growing, growing, growing since 2019 and how many people were again, um, engage in all these tortures and so on and so forth. What we're seeing now is, of course, unprecedented violence on not only activists, but all sorts of people who are captured on the street. Some bypass, you know, people who do bystanders, uh, their phone being checked, um, you know, all of these things, they've been harassed personally and so on and so forth. So um, I think we really need to put it in, in, in this perspective that there is a variety of claims that um, comes out from all sorts of places. And one of them is political claims, obviously, which is very important. But um, these voices cannot find ways to channel themselves institutionally. And that's what at least the political activists who um, I'm talking to um, are talking about right now, that they don't want to miss this window of opportunity uh, before further repressions start and and like you know, and there will be no change for, for reforms. And they're really calling um, President Tokayev and the government for opening up the political um, field itself a little bit, opening up the space for uh, more representation for the, first of all, election of the local governance, uh, governors, Akims. And that was the thing that was voiced in, in Jan Aozien, because the, the governor should be not should, be, should not be appointed by the president himself. They should be elected by the people in these localities for that person to be accountable to the people so that they don't need to come out on the streets or squares and protest. They can like, you know, uh, be able to, to build that dialogue and account for that person who should be reelected if, if, if they want to be reelected. Another crucial thing is, of course, the, um, the but building stronger parliament because we have it as an institution, but everybody, it's, it's not a hidden transcript anymore that parliament doesn't really work. And, and it's very, very important for, for these activists to sort of like you know, open up uh, parliament for, for, for these perspectives. I just want to briefly, last, last point, if I can throw something in, is that there is a lot of socioeconomic grievance building on that. Um, I, I find this book absolutely useful. Balihar Sanghera and um, Elmira Satabaldi were working and, and writing in huge detail about um, you know, um, morality, uh, grassroots movements, protests, uh, precisely on socioeconomic issues and rentier states. Um, and resistance from a particular, a very fantastic sociological analysis. I think that is that picture is also there. But um, what I think is is, is very very important is that um, we need to also pay attention of how people can can channel these grievances apart from constantly re uh, resorting to this idea of protest. Because what we're seeing, what uh, these mothers with many children, Dolshiki and so on, um, they always go to the presidential palace. But that's not how it's supposed to work in a state that is governing itself. Uh, according to specific institutions. The, 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 the president, old or new, or whoever comes next, doesn't really matter, I'm not a fortune teller, should not be the only locus of power to which people um, you know, go on and sort of like ask him personally to deal with their, with their problem, either political or socioeconomic. There should be a variety of institutions and a variety of different political groups that are able to gain access to these institutions in order to channel these grievances in the future. So I think that's, in my opinion, one of the best ways um, to build the post-conflict society and to get out of the situation that we find ourselves currently in. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Um, any uh, comments, maybe other comments on the, the, the risk of a uh, more repressive uh, framework in terms of um, political and, and public action and comments on the, the kind of Islamist connection? The theme <laughs> going, oh, D no, Dinisa. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, Azamat, Azamat, Azamat sorry. <laughs> I think the claims about Islamist connection are just as ridiculous as the claims about the 20,000 uh, invisible foreign fighters. Yeah, so um, it's silly. I mean, it's obviously they're saying it because they have to say, it, right? I mean, uh, CSTO is really not supposed to intervene, just like Dosim said, is not supposed to intervene in, in sort of intra elite fighting. And it did this time. And so perhaps the invocation of foreign involvement or you know the the tired old boogeyman of the islamic threat you know was a necessity and uh, again only time will tell what the price is for this thanks uh bruce you know i just wanted to throw in one more thing there is you know it is a ludicrous claim but besides the fact that it opens the door for the csto to come in 
it also implies that the threat that, that Kazakh people did not have anything to do with it. So you're, they're not blaming anyone in Kazakhstan and it kind of exonerates, you know, everyone within the country because it wasn't them that were responsible for it. They were, they could work things out on their own. It was this outside element that was inserted into Kazakhstan that was responsible for it. So it's, you know, there's, there seems to be more than one reason for making this claim. Yeah. We are in a strange state now where I think we have, even from the government, the part of the story they're telling is true, right? It was an, it was an attempt at overthrowing the government, but they are stopping short of telling us about uh, actual culprits. And it's a really strange artificial kind of being suspended in midair and like stuck there like situation because it's unnatural. And I don't know if being stuck in this unnatural position is going to hinder, probably it will, Tokayev's ability to sort of build the you know, new Kazakhstan he's been talking about. Denisa? Yes, I wanted to comment on sort of uh, sort of background for this uh, Islamic connection. And I do think that it's been sort of a rhetorical device in order to frame the uh, sort of the, the, the um, uh, legitimate protesters and uh, sort of justify repression. However, there is a background. In 2019, Kairat Satibaldi, uh, a known Wahhabi sympathizer, a billionaire, uh, a Nazarbayev nephew, attempted to organize an Islamic party, uh, 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 acronym uh, HAQ, uh, but the party was blocked by the authorities. They didn't allow the party to register, right? Uh, Kairat is a uh, billionaire, I said, large shareholder in the telecommunication infrastructure, uh, holding Kazakh Telecom, Kaspi Bank, and cellular op operator uh, KSL. So this is the connection, and again, this is the part of that hated clan, that hated group of insiders uh, who were sort of grouped together with, you know, the protesters uh, targeted them. They wanted Nazarbayev and his clan gone, right? So I, I just wanted to throw this uh, in as a background to help explain where does that sort of uh, Islamist uh, element is coming from. Yeah. Thank I you so much. Yeah. That yeah. No, Denisa makes an excellent point. I think that it's, 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 you know, it's significant, it's, but it's homegrown. And, but they are now doing this unnatural contortions, trying to say that it's some kind of a mysterious foreign force where the answer is right in front of us. But apparently there is an agreement not to talk about that, right? It's the he who must not be named, right? So I guess it will remain like that for now. But again, I think it's really useful to look at the bones flying out from under the rug because the answers are all there. Does he want to, do you want to add something on that aspect? Yes, very short comments. Well, uh, we should to look to the official uh, narrative, official propaganda, because when Mr. Tokayev, he said about the threats, he, he said, well, extremists, terrorists, and banditas. Well, he didn't say about the uh, extremist religious organization, because it's too difficult. Well, it's too difficult, yes, for him to, to understand to the, uh, another world, what kind of religious extremist organization participated in these uh, events. Because I'm, I'm sure that uh, in these events, we didn't saw uh, Islam as a mainstream. Uh, we didn't saw uh, participation of very big and active religious organization. Yes, maybe some people, uh, who participated in this section, maybe they belong to different religious uh, organization, but uh, we should to look in the prospects. Yes, I know. Now, uh, well, if we talk about the, um, some people in political leaders, uh, the most people talk only about the Karat Satipaldi. But we should, uh, you, you should live in Kazakhstan, because I know a lot of people in our political and business elite who supported different religious, uh, not organization, different religious mood, moods. Well, and uh, uh, a lot of uh, our officials last time, yes, yeah, they prefer to speak, well, I am Muslim. Well, and I believe this is maybe it's one of the good basis for development of Kazakhstan. That's why, that's why uh, a lot of people in Kazakhstan, they pay a lot of attention to Turkey, to Mr. Erdogan. 
And when, if we talk about the future, I, I, I don't talk about the last events, I talk about the future. I believe that maybe next 10, 15 years, not only in Kazakhstan, but in all Central Asia countries, we can see a lot of young people who will be more close connected with Muslim world, but not to Eurasia Economical Union, to Western countries. Yes, Muslim world, it will be maybe more real prospects for the most uh, countries in Central Asia. Well, and that's why I believe Turkey and Mr. Dagan, he know about it. He knows about it because he believe, well, in future, maybe Turkey will be one, one of the very good example as a model of state development, model of economical development for young people. That's why Turkey now very active. Well, but for us, maybe it's very good because we need some balance against Russia and China. And I supported active of, of Turkey in our region. Because without any balance I, between beer and dragons, well, I believe our future will be more worse. Thank you. Berlin, if I may add quickly, um, I know we're almost out of time. I think, um, I mean, again, I think all of us are having these endless conversations about what happened. And one thing that I heard yesterday really stuck with me. I was speaking with a friend, um, and he said, did you listen to the latest address by the Almaty Oblast governor, right? And I said, no, I didn't. What about it? And he said that I have never heard them you talk in such a differential manner when addressing the people. He, he felt it was a complete change of tone. And that, you know, we start talking about this. And, you know, I think there is a good argument to be made that the elite in Kazakhstan has sort of lost the sense of impunity that they've had. Yes, we don't have brand new ministers who have never before set foot inside the government. Like this did not happen. But I think that sense of impunity and, and arrogance that they've carried that has been their signature, they've lost now. I think they genuinely fear people in a way that that has not ever been the case in the last 30 years, right? And that's perhaps a good thing right, that they do not have the sense of impunity that they have had for so long. Well, I think that's, yeah, Denisa, would you like to add on that? I want to echo this. I think uh, Azamad is, on the, sort of, is capturing something very important. And sort of in, in my opinion, uh, what we've seen is a real strong challenge to authoritarian rule. And it was so scary and so real that uh, the uh, that Nazarbayev with his close cronies fled the country and extricated themselves from the government positions, right? So I, I think this is what happened. And I think what we see with the um, protests go astray with all the violence, that was sort of the cover up and it was sort of the uh, sort of the planned operation to discredit the protest and intensify oppression to maintain the remaining part of the authoritarian regime. Great, I think that, that's a great conclusion and, and an optimist one. So let, let, let's stop on that. I, I wanted to thank you all of you for really, really great, great comments and showing all the, the depths of your knowledge and the different direction of, of uh, the, the, the interpretation we may have about what uh, uh, is happening, still happening in Kazakhstan and what would be the impact on the uh, uh, long run. And I wanted, I, I forgot at the beginning, I apologize for that to remind you that this event is uh, co-organized with our uh, friend from the Davis Center uh, for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard. Uh, university, the Oxus Society for Central Asian Affairs, and uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. So once again, thank you everyone for being with us today, for being very active on the chat, and thank you to our five speakers, and, and uh, uh, all the best for all of those of you who are in Kazakhstan now. Thank you. Bye-bye.